Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to our third and final uh, part of our webinar series, Envisioning Equitable and Sustainable Housing. Uh, two weeks ago, we focused on a framework for how equity, environment, sustainability, resilience, and housing all intersect with each other and with communities on the ground. And then last week, we heard from three local projects that are conquering sustainable development. And today is an opportunity for three federal agencies that are part of the Urban Waters Federal Partnership to respond to what we have been hearing throughout our webinar series. Um, and by talking about the resources and programs that they have to offer to ensure that we're properly responding to climate change and environmental threats in our communities. So again, my name is Erica Rossetti. I'm the Urban Waters Coordinator at the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary. I'll be monitoring today's uh, webinar and managing the Q&A along with my colleague, Roberto Fragoni, who's from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Just some quick Zoom reminders as usual. Uh, first, you'll notice all participants are automatically muted with your video turned off, so you should only be able to see our speakers today. Um, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to use the Q&A feature, which should be on the bottom tab of your Zoom screen. Um, the chat is also open to everyone if you want to chat with each other for networking, uh, but we do ask if you have any questions to use that Q&A feature. Um, there will be time at the end for all Q&A. And finally, the webinar is also being recorded, so we will share that recording with everyone after the webinar today. And again, before we get started, I'm going to start our poll for a couple of minutes just to see who's in the room, um, what sector you're all from, and what location you're tuning into so our speakers have a good idea of who to cater their audience to. And as a reminder, this webinar, uh, in addition to the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary and Housing and Urban Development, is being brought to you by the Urban Waters Delaware River location. This designated location uh, focuses on the urban areas of the Lower Delaware River. So that includes Camden, New Jersey, Chester, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Wilmington, Delaware. We do span three states and have many similar issues in this urban waterfront corridor, spanning from uh, flooding to increased development to socioeconomic inequities all of which are being exacerbated by climate change. So the benefit of being part of the Urban Waters Federal Partnership is the coordination of 15 federal agencies nationwide that are all invested in these issues and invested in environmental justice and water equity. So each of these federal agencies offers resources of their own way, um, for our communities that can aid us in sustainable development moving forward as we consider not only historical inequities, but also inequities that we're going to face as we face climate change. So I'm very pleased to be able to connect all of you today with three of our Urban Waters Federal Agencies uh, to present on some of the programs and resources that they have to assist us with this work. So we're going to hear from Justin Sheed from Housing and Urban Development, from Shannon McLaughlin from FEMA Region 2, and also from Lance Caldwell, Tawana Bootin, Nikki Alexander from EPA Region 2. And before I turn it over to our speakers, let me share the results of our poll. So it looks like we've got a nice even uh, mix today, about 20% or about a third each from federal, local, and then nonprofits, and also a couple of just general community members, uh, people in education, teachers, and the private sector. And most of our attendees are from the Delaware River location, but we do have a couple folks tuning in from the Southeast and the Northeast and other states as well. So 
Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to our first presenter, Justin Sheed, who is the Newark, New Jersey Field Office Director um, with Housing and Urban Development. Thank you, Erica. Bear with me one second, and I'm just going to grab maybe my presentation. Uh, there it is. Okay, got it. <laughs> All right. Thanks to Erica and to the partnership for um, Delaware, as this series is really covering critical topics um, that require partnership and working together to advance solutions and solve problems. So I really appreciate your partnership and the efforts of my hug colleague, Roberto Fragoni, for helping put this together as well. So I'm gonna give you a quick overview of what HUD does for those that aren't too familiar with us. So HUD's a $60 billion federal agency that funds and oversees public housing, affordable housing and subsidized programs for individuals and private properties, provides for community development block grant funding and regulates and oversees the nation's housing market. So today I will um, talk a bit about HUD as a federal agency is shifting its focus to uh, address climate and resilience if my computer cooperates. Um, so it's given me some problems, but <laughs> I'll start ahead here. Every office within HUD has worked to contribute to our new climate action plan. It was released last November and outlines a comprehensive strategy for how the agency is going to work across all levels of government and with partners to address the climate crisis and ensure that communities, especially those at greatest risk, will be treated equitably. Uh, and a quick note here that, that I'll show on the screen soon is that President Biden also signed the Justice 40 executive order that commits 40% of the overall benefits of federal climate funding to disadvantaged communities. And just a quick check, because my screen is freezing. Are you all still seeing the first slide, but not it's not moving forward, right? Yeah, we're not. Justin, do you want me to share the slides on my end? Yeah, maybe if you don't mind, just because it's giving my computer a little bit of a conniption. Sorry about that. And then I can just, thanks, Erica. So if you go to the second slide for a second, this is what I just mentioned about the climate action plan. So we'll share this with the link. It was released in November and then go to the third slide. So HUD is trying to do both a department-wide and a government-wide approach to the climate crisis. So what we're talking about is making uh, considerable changes to the way that we operate our $4.5 million public and assisted housing units. HUD's FHA portfolio, which consists of 76 million single family loans, 11,000 multifamily insured loans, hospitals, and more, and then uh, more than $90 billion in disaster recovery dollars since 1993, and our regular formula funding, which I'll talk about in a bit. So next slide. A sampling of what we're going to do. So when it comes to climate resilience, we're gonna be requiring all 1,200 local jurisdictions that re receive community development block grant allocations to incorporate resilience to natural hazard risks and address climate impacts uh, of low and moderate income residents because those folks are disproportionately affected by um, so many climate threats. We're gonna review current building data to map climate risks, do vulnerability assessments and feasibility based on climate risk data, strengthen our flood resilience standards, and provide expansive community resilience and sustainability resources for communities and stakeholders. And I'll share some links to some of that later. On greenhouse gas emissions, that second goal, we're gonna be providing benchmarking and data tracking, green building requirements and incentives, and programs in partnership with the Department of Energy to commit to reductions. Then finally on environmental justice, we'll be addressing barriers uh, to housing discrimination, uh, and partnering with EPA to address Superfund sites and, housing, and um, housing and communities as well. So next slide. Uh, this is a bit of the how. So we have our annual grants at HUD, which include, as I mentioned, our, our funding to 
uh, has what we call entitlement communities, but most large cities or decent sized towns within the state of New Jersey or Pennsylvania or Delaware do get a direct allocation from us. Uh, public housing authorities as well also receive direct funding from us on an annual basis through a formula process. We have plenty of competitive or um, uh, some non-competitive grants, but primarily what we're talking about there, which we'll share a little bit of later, is our choice planning grants, our choice implementation grants, and some of the work that we do within the Healthy Homes portfolio. And then, as I mentioned before too, within the Federal Housing Administration and the government-sponsored enterprises that HUD oversees, that's mortgage, mortgage insurance on properties that we're talking about there. So next slide. Specific to post-disaster funding. So we all know Hurricane Ida hit New Jersey pretty hard. We're expecting the allocation and community development block grant disaster recovery dollars there. That you know, really affected some of our HUD-assisted housing developments in notably in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and in Englewood, and we're working with those communities and those residents to help them get um, not just temporary housing, but rehab those buildings, make them more resilient, and get those folks back up on their feet. But we learned a lot of lessons in the post-Sandy context. So after Sandy, $60 billion was allocated to the federal government to rebuild the New York, New Jersey region back better and stronger. Um, a couple of those uh, big projects that came out of that that I'd like to mention that I think are, are interesting points for us to consider here are whole of community approaches to solving climate challenges. So through, in partnership with philanthropy and, um, and some you know, international design firms and with communities, HUD awarded two projects within the state of New Jersey. One is the uh, Rebuild by Design Hudson River project, which is providing $230 million for comprehensive coastal defense around the city of Hoboken and a little bit into Jersey City and the Weehawken as well. Uh, and in particular there, our most vulnerable community, which was flooded the worst, is primarily public housing in the southwest corner of the city. So our aim there is to work with the state of New Jersey and those local communities to make sure that those never feel the brunt of, those st of, of storm surge and bad storms in the future. Similar concept in the Meadowlands, $150 million to help protect low-lying communities there. Uh, as I mentioned, the post-IDA allocations will be announced soon. There's a challenge here too, and that so many disasters have hit in the past couple of years, and it just keeps coming with increasing frequency. So we have to be really creative about how we think about both those annual allocations, the disaster allocations, and ensuring that we rebuild resilience for the future. So next slide. On the last week's uh, session, which was fantastic, Frank McLaughlin from New Jersey DEP spoke a bit about the Kramer Hill transformation and revitalization that's going on. From the HUD perspective, uh, uh, you know, it's critical for us to understand that all of our sectors are interrelated. And Frank covered this certainly from the environmental protection state, uh, side of things. And for us, that means that in communities, we need to think about the environment and resilience when we're building housing and vice versa. So Camden presents a great case study on how to make everything align and get an incredible project off the ground. So due to the commitment from the community, from having deep community engagement and neighborhood plans, HUD awarded $35 million through our Choice Neighborhood Grant Program to transform the Ablett Village uh, development, which is public housing and will be sort of a comprehensive strategy to bring in both uh, mixed income market rate and affordable housing throughout that neighborhood. We leveraged with the private sector there, with EPA Brownfields and, DE, and New Jersey DEP funding in the surrounding areas, including stormwater and infrastructure improvements, and nonprofit park and recreational opportunities for residents to improve their outcomes as well. So next slide. So I also wanted to bring up that a lot of our work is, and this certainly applies in the environmental justice context, is to address home health hazards. So quick mention here that within our competitive grants are opportunities for funding around lead hazard in, in homes and healthy homes. Uh, we just awarded 2.7 million to two entities in New Jersey for healthy home production this month. And there are a number of lead hazard remediation uh, programs being funded by housing authorities and communities throughout the state as well. And then next slide. So 
Lastly, and to close, HUD has published a new climate site that provides resources, support, and tools, including the Community Resilience Toolkit. All of this can be found at hud.gov backslash climate. I'm working with the team to stand up additional pieces of our Climate Communities Initiative throughout the country that will hold peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities, stakeholder engagement with underserved communities, and direct support to a cohort of climate cities in the near future. And so with all of this, we need partners from all sectors to come together to think innovatively, ensure that those disproportionately affected are at the table, come up with comprehensive and thoughtful plans, and to embark on concerted efforts to help towns and cities to focus climate action on the needs of our most vulnerable and further climate equity. So I'd really like to encourage you to work with me, with Roberto, whether you have a designation, a grant program or not, we're here to try to help bring those puzzle pieces together to make sure that our um, communities and those who need it most are uh, resilient, especially in the wake of all that's to come. So with that, let me turn it back to you, Erica. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justin. Uh, I'm sure Justin and Roberto will be able to put some of those links in the chat for everyone and we can share them afterwards as well today. And I encourage everyone, if you do have questions, to go ahead and put those in the Q&A and we'll be happy to answer them all at the end. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to our second speaker, Shannon McLaughlin, who is the Community Planning and Capacity Building Coordinator at FEMA Region 2. And I'll turn it over to you, Shannon. Thanks so much, um, Erica. And um, thanks to Erica and Roberto both for putting on a really remarkable series of webinars. It's been a great honor and pleasure to, um, to partake in them. And it's great to follow Justin, who's a real ninja when it comes to being creative um, with federal money, finding ways to get through problems that you know others have would throw up their hands at. So um, uh, it's, it's great to be on a panel with him and my friends from EPA. Um, my name is Shannon McLaughlin. I'm community planner at FEMA Region 2. And I'll be speaking about partnerships in the context of equity, resilience, and disasters. My talk is in three main sections. First, some recent mandates and program changes at FEMA that may align with your work or provide novel, um, oh, sorry, provide novel opportunities for collaboration. And then I'll look at a case study. As I discuss the Long Island Smart Growth Partnership, I'll be highlighting process considerations in the hope of generating ideas for ways you can leverage federal or other institutional resources. And I'll cover resilience resources where relevant throughout my talk, as well as highlighting at the end ways to partner with FEMA in a recovery and some other opportunities coming out of the federal government. So first, what's new? There are a lot of changes at FEMA, so I'm focusing here on developments pertinent to the themes of this series, resilience, equity, and climate. Before that, the backdrop. Um, increased frequency and intensity of disasters in recent years means there's never any downtime for emergency managers. The new normal is bigger disasters, greater impacts, less predictability. FEMA has had to keep growing and adapting to meet the times. However, the pressure has also been building for, for years to find a better way to support communities without breaking, breaking the bank. One strategy to tackle these runaway disaster costs is to shift our focus so we're spending more on mitigation and resilience building, that is protecting assets against insults rather than rebuilding them after a disaster strikes. By most accounts, it's a wise strategy as every dollar spent on mitigation saves $6 later, according to studies with even higher returns for certain disaster types. Fortunately, the pace of program and policy improvements is also brisk. I'll cover a few recent developments, starting with FEMA's new program to support innovative mitigation, the BRIC program. The development of Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities, or BRIC, reflects the momentum to accelerate mitigation spending and reduce disaster response costs. BRIC aims to categorically shift the federal focus away from disaster, from reactive disaster spending and toward research supported proactive investment in community resilience. And this is a big program. For fiscal year 2021, our second year, a billion dollars is available up from 700 million in, in the prior year. 
BRIC prioritizes projects that demonstrate innovative approaches to partnerships, such as shared funding mechanisms or project design, or ones that provide benefits in addition to risk reduction. The program includes an annual allocation for each state, a tribal set aside, and a national mitigation project competition. In terms of the competition, the Mid-Atlantic did very well in that first round of funding. Here's some of the BRIC projects. Um, the first year BRIC saw six projects in the Mid-Atlantic secure funding. From removal of a dam in Newcastle, New York, to flood mitigation in DC, these six projects represent $127 million that will be working toward a more resilient Mid-Atlantic region. 2021 was also a historic year for our hazard mitigation grant program. Uh, this is funding that's available after a presidentially declared disaster and COVID, though it represented a massive outlay, did trigger an allocation. Prior to last year's funding of 3.46 billion, as you see there, the program had spent a total of 15 billion over the course of its 30 year life. So this, this was a major, a major uh, change in the scale of the program. Um, as a result, every state, tribe and territory that received a COVID declaration was eligible to receive 4% of their disaster costs to invest in risk reduction. And here's what that 4% looks like in our area. State OEMs who are programming this funding right now are in a unique position to buy down their risk and as the administration urged them to do to treat the climate crisis with the urgency it deserves. Does this funding matter for your work? Well, it could, that's my main message. Um, the mitigation action portfolio describes innovative mitigation projects and underlies the importance of partnerships. There are thousands of ways to mitigate and dozens of them are featured in the portfolio with detailed summaries that can be used as examples. Region 2's lead mitigation planner, Jack Heidi, has also developed a suite of new guides for thinking creatively about how to increase the reach of mitigation activities. There are 11 expanding mitigation guides available with more in the works. Another significant development is a growing focus on equity. As Justin mentioned, Justice 40, um, for far too long, environmental policy decisions failed to adequately account for the disproportionate, disparate, and cumulative impacts that pollution and climate change have on low-income communities and communities of color. Justice 40 is part of the administration's answer. It's a whole of government initiative to secure, to ensure that federal agencies work with states and locals to deliver at least 40% of the overall benefits from federal investments in climate and clean energy to disadvantaged communities. What does this mean in terms of FEMA? FEMA's new administrator, Deanne Criswell, the first woman to lead the agency, has already had a significant impact on FEMA's culture. One of her first initiatives was the production of a new five-year strategic plan which focuses on just three main areas, equity, climate resilience, and workforce readiness. It's easy to gloss over this, but for an agency that has long focused on operational concerns, requiring our programs to consider equity represents a sea change. An overt focus on climate resilience is also a major leap forward. Both will require us initiating new partnerships to learn from experts, organizations, and residents we haven't worked with before. Okay, now on to my case study. Um, as we approach the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Sandy, I wanted to use this opportunity to take a look back at a partnership that my community planning team developed with EPA and New York State Department of State to assist Sandy impacted communities, the Long Island Smart Growth Partnership. Early in the Sandy recovery process, New York directed FEMA's community planners to focus on Long Island. In keeping with the National Disaster Recovery Framework, we formed a partnership with EPA and New York State's Department of State, who are largely responsible for climate and resilience planning in New York. Our goal was to work with Long Island's two counties to develop and incorporate a set of regional goals for smart growth and resiliency while bringing sound science into the recovery process. The partnership recognized a need to build on existing local efforts to align with New York State policies and programs and to establish strong intergovernmental coordination. It considered resilient rebuilding in lower risk areas to create room for more participants 
and to allow it to address widespread issues like environmental justice. Um, it participated in the New York Rising Community Reconstruction Program funded by HUD CDBGDR funds and used the resulting outreach and plans to refine our goals. Over the course of nearly nine years, we used the mechanisms and relationships established in the partnership to complete a dozen different projects to support Long Island. The last of those, a resilient codes project may be of particular interest to this group as it can be used widely. The partnership worked with a top planning firm to develop a local land use resilience assessment tool. We then field tested it with Long Beach and Mastic Beach on Long Island, and later with several upstate communities who experienced riverine flooding. Over the course of six months, we convened with communities to review their multiple plans, assess their resilience framework, identify priority areas, and develop an agenda to address them. For every challenge, we looked at four main activity categories that could be used to tackle it, removing barriers and building partnerships, education and plan changes, adopting incentives, and enacting priorities. Along with hundreds of recommended actions, there are dozens of links to communities that have successfully enacted a given solution, making the ideas in the tool tangible. The audience for RISE is communities that have already developed forward-looking comprehensive plans or resilience goals. Now, at the risk of being a little rudimentary, I wanted to note some of the lessons from that successful nine-year partnership, hoping to spark ideas for others. Um, the partnership discovered that we would need to utilize each other's and authorities and resources to be effective. For each project, the team looked for ways to draw on complementary resources of the agency or the state to build offerings that were stronger or more in-depth than what they'd provided in the past on their own. The agencies utilized contract mechanisms, a research program and facilitation services that EPA already had in place. And we provided scenario planning software and training, which FEMA could pay for, along with travel to deliver technical assistance. As a result of leveraging existing tools and channels, we were able to integrate resilience goals into the process much earlier than we would have been able to otherwise. Another lesson was the value of different forms to build necessarily necessary buy-in and to enlist champions at different stages in the program. Initially, the group needed leadership support, which was secured through developing a white paper, summarizing the needs and providing research on best practices in recovery. A symposium brought many additional parties to the table during the initial development phase. These included community groups and researchers whose experience informed our projects. These stakeholders then brought in partners they'd worked with, some of whom became our partners, like the Nature Conservancy, who helped us complete an ecosystem services valuation that Nassau County needed to make the case for policy changes. So in general, we maintained momentum and drew on a wide variety of stakeholders by surveying widely. Different forums connected us to champions, some of whom became our partners. Extensive outreach in a long time horizon allowed us to envision holistic solutions and to understand the footholds already present on Long Island that could be used to develop them. A little more on opportunities here, last bit. Um, how can your organization or agency integrate with federal recovery efforts? This question brings us back to the National Disaster Recovery Framework and the role of recovery support functions, or RSFs. The recovery framework was new after Sandy. It provided a structure for agencies with different authorities, resources, and expertise to work together in person in a given joint field office to address large and complex recovery challenges. After a major disaster, these sector-based teams will be activated. For each of the sectors listed on the right, there is an RSF whose job is to integrate the larger universe of resources and harmonize them so that all the stakeholders will be working in unity. After a disaster, you can contact your, your sector's field coordinator to be looped into discussions on recovery resources, to raise concerns, or to leverage your organization in the service of recovery. And you can always contact the FEMA-led RSF, Community Planning and Capacity Building, which is the group I'm in, to get involved in recovery coordination. Each of FEMA's 10 regions has a dedicated community planning and capacity building coordinator who is active at all times. One other little federal opportunity I just didn't, didn't wanna miss um, given the timing of this. 
Um, there's a lot of new mandates coming out of the executive branch, which are informing federal pro programs, whether through changes to existing programs or funding or developing new ones. In addition to Justice 40, others to bear in mind, there are others to bear in mind. And most importantly, I wanted to recall for everyone the bipartisan infrastructure law, which will bring a lot of funding to every region in the country and will require new collaborations. If funding is going to them, state agencies are often responsible for deciding on how federal funds, funds are programmed and spent. So following their websites or listservs is a good way to keep up on new directions, which provide partnership opportunities. Even a small initiative can turn into something big. Partnerships beget partnerships. As I noted, each FEMA region has a CPCB coordinator. I cover region two, New York, New Jersey, USVI and Puerto Rico. And Winnie Kwan is the CPCB coordinator for Region 3. And I think Winnie was able to join us today. So I'll ask her to quick turn on her camera and say hello if she can. So you have a face to go along with the name. Um, maybe that's not, I'm not sure if it's possible. Sorry, Roberto. Um, anyway, you have here, and you'll get the slides, um, my information as well as Winnie's information if you're in FEMA Region 3, which is DC, Delaware, Maryland, Pennsylvania. Virginia and West Virginia. And with that, I will turn it over to the next speaker. Thanks. Thank you so much, Shannon. And I did try to promote Winnie to be a panelist in case, uh, they would like to say a few words. Sorry, I had a, it kicked me out and brought me back in, but hi, my name is Winnie Kwana, PCB coordinator in region three. Um, great to be part of this and thanks Shannon for um, providing this opportunity to meet everybody. Thank you. Thanks for hopping on and uh, introducing yourself. Great, so thank you so much, Shannon. I'm really glad to see uh, FEMA dollars going to our region and all of those mitigation plans in the RISE assessment tool that you've been working on. I'd love to share those with our registrants today. Um, it's also great to see your focus on Justice 40 and equity, climate resilience, and partnership with other federal agencies as well. Uh, so that being said, I will turn it over to our final federal agency today. We have a couple folks with us from Region 2 at the EPA, Lance Caldwell, Tawana Booten, and Nikki Alexander, all from the strategic programs team in the office of the regional administrator. Um, so I will turn it over to the EPA at this time to wrap us up today. And just as a reminder, please feel free to continue putting, putting your questions in the Q&A feature. Hey, I'll, I'll kick off with the introductions and thank you, Erica, for, for um, introducing us uh, first. I also just wanted to mention that uh, uh, Kathleen Bell is, is here with us too on the same, she's on the same strategic integrations team and, and she's the one presenting the slides. So thanks to Kathleen. Um, so we're here to talk about, as mentioned, we're with EPA and, and uh, uh, the Region 2 office, which is based in New York, but it covers New York, New Jersey and the US Caribbean. And um, we're here to talk about communities and equitable uh, revitalization and some of the programs that we have. And we're gonna talk about three different programs. And if you don't mind going to the next slide, Kathleen. Uh, the three different programs that we're talking about is, um, Community Driven Solutions, which we have the Community Driven Solutions coordinator with us, Nikki Alexander. We're going to talk about environmental justice, which we have the environmental justice coordinator with us, Tawana Booten. And I'll be talking a little bit about some of the community revitalization programs that we do. So I'll turn it over to Nikki now. Great. Thanks, Lance. Yeah. So as Lance said, my name is Nikki Alexander. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator. And I mostly work on this initiative called Community Driven Solutions. So the whole point of Community Driven Solutions is to enhance the EPA's collaboration with communities. And that includes bringing in other federal partners, state partners, local partners, 
and even community-based organizations and residents. So it's a very collaborative initiative in that way. The goal is to provide communities with access to funding, training, capacity building, and other technical assistance so that they can meaningfully engage in EPA's decision-making processes and can design and implement local solutions to address their priorities. So really what we're trying to do is have more of a bottom-up approach and allow communities to become part of this decision-making that we do at the federal level. Um, and we do that by involving a select number of communities, especially because we can't necessarily focus on every single community in region two. So you'll see here a list of all of the different communities in New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, US Virgin Islands, and then two Indian nations that do collaborate with our community driven solutions program as well. Um, there is overlap between the Urban Waters Federal Partnership and our Community Driven Solutions Initiative. So for example, in Camden, most relevant to this webinar, um, we do have a very strong partnership there. And then also in, uh, in Newark, where you have the Passaic River watershed, um, and the Passaic River also goes through Trenton, so, um, so overlap in those cities as well. And then finally in Caño Martín Peña, um, which is in Puerto Rico, um, mostly our Community Environmental Protection Division works with uh, Caño Martín Peña, but, um, but that is also part of our Community Driven Solutions Programming. Today, I'm actually going to provide a case study from St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands. The U.S. Virgin Islands is, um, is part of our region that often does not get the attention it deserves. And uh, there was a crisis with the Lime Tree Bay refinery that really put it in the spotlight and made it a focus, especially with our community-driven community driven solutions programming, but also with other divisions in the EPA. Uh, next slide, Kathy. So the Lime Tree Bay oil refinery, which has since uh, completely closed its operations and is currently in the process of selling the refinery to uh, another buyer, um, is located on the island of St. Croix. So St. Croix is the largest of the three islands in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, it has a southern industrial corridor, which has the refinery. It also has a distillery and many other industrial operations that make it into what we often call a sacrifice zone uh, that turns out to be something that really, really affects folks who live in the area. Um, the majority of the population in this Southern corridor and then also in Frederickstead, which is, you can see it on the, um, on the Western portion of the map, they are really affected by this industrial corridor, mostly because the winds blow east to west in St. Croix. And so all of that industrial production actually just blows into Frederickstead. So everything in the way, and you'll see from the estate population map, um, there are a lot of folks who live in the southern corridor and then especially that southwestern portion of the island. And they are all affected by this industrial production that happens in the southern quarter. So, um, so yeah, I do just also want to mention that it's divided into estates, which are sort of what we would think of as um, as block groups or something like that. So they're very small collections of people, but that's how that's how it is. Um, that's how Saint Croix is divided. Next slide, please, Kathy. So here is a timeline of how this St. Croix disaster unfolded. Um, operations did begin in February 2021. Uh, there was a permit issue during the previous presidential administration for Lime Tree Bay to begin operations. And then really from the get-go, from February to May of 2021, there started to be a series of incidents at the refinery, which led to releases of toxic substances, and really culminated in this flare event that you see in this photo on the right. And that ended up spewing oil droplets and other contaminants all over the communities uh, near this industrial corridor and especially in Frederickstead. So what we did in the Community Driven Solutions Program and the Strategic Programs Office at EPA is we set up a community hotline to learn directly from the community what they were experiencing, what, what was this doing to their health, to their local environment, 
And we found out that it was affecting the community disproportionately in Frederickstead. Um, as you can see on the map, the white dots show where the calls came from on the hotline. So we were able to track the, um, where the calls were originating. So those calls were mostly from Frederickstead. There were also other parts of the island, but you see how it kind of moves at, into more concentrated white dots as you go west. So Frederickstead did bear the brunt of this contamination um, and people were experiencing horrible symptoms. They had to go to the hospital. They had horrible fits of, fits of coughing. They had terrible nausea and were vomiting constantly. Um, their pets got sick, their gardens died, their trees that were hundreds of years old died. Um, so it was, it was a very tragic situation. And we were able to compile all of this data that we received from the community and, you know, and get everyone from every division involved. And eventually EPA was able to, um, was able to issue a section 303 order. Uh, and that basically provided injunctive relief to temporarily halt operations at the refinery. And EPA can only do this if there is an imminent and substantial threat to public health and the local environment and public welfare. And so it was deemed, especially from these community calls, that this was the case. And that was, that was true even before we were able to get monitoring, monitoring on the ground. Um, so in June of 2021, because of the shutdown, Lime Tree Bay announced that it will actually have to extend the shutdown due to finances. And that ended up continuing through the end of 2021. So since July of 2021, EPA teams from different divisions are working with local officials, with community leaders, university researchers, and other federal agencies to really understand how we can continue our response as there are still contaminated cisterns, uh, which is what the uh, Crucians mostly rely on for their drinking water. Um, so there continue to be outstanding issues that need to be addressed. But then we also want to think about future mitigation strategies. So especially given that St. Croix is an island, uh, it is particularly vulnerable to climate change. And then with this industrial corridor, that obviously compounds it. So in this case study, we really do see a melding of environmental justice and climate change issues into what we call climate justice. And um, so even though this is not an urban watershed, a designated area, I, I felt like this was a really great example for, uh, for the webinar today. So I'm going to turn it over to Tawana. Okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting EPA. I want to introduce myself again, our Region 2's EJ and Children's Environment to health coordinator. So here in region two, sorry, I, my bandwidth is, is uh, very low. So it kept freezing. So I didn't turn my camera back on. So here in region two, we're in the process of finalizing our draft EJ work plan. Thank you, sorry. And that work plan encompasses and overlaps with children's Sorry, things are popping up on my screen, sorry. Community-driven solutions with focused communities, children's environmental health action plan, the lead action plan, and climate change action plan. Sorry, next slide. So you may have heard of EJ Screen. Here is a snapshot of Camden, which we spoke about earlier. And this EJ screen snapshot shows an environmental factor of cli uh, climate justice. And the red portion of it, which you'll see to the uh, left, shows the uh, hazard zones, the flood, sorry, coastal flood hazard zones. And the deeper the red, the higher the uh, coastal flood hazard is. Next slide. So here with the EJ screen climate justice, we have to the left, we have the six feet rise in sea level, which the area is in blue, the deeper blue. Then we have a demographic index, which shows um, 
area communities with areas of EJ concerns, which you will find in the deeper red. And this is also still a snapshot of Camden. And then when you combine the two or overlap the maps when using EJ screen, you'll see towards the Southwest, you have like the darker blue and the darker um, red, which gives us uh, somewhat like a purple in the Southwest. So when you overlap those two, you can see where the area of concern is for the community and including the environmental factor of climate justice. And just want to give that, we spoke about Camden, so just want to give a quick EJ screen um, snapshot of that and I'll turn it over to Lance. Hey, before I start, yeah, I've got the, uh, I've got my background as a snapshot of EJ screen as well. Um, I put the link in the chat. Um, and as Erica mentioned, it's a, it's a really great tool. There's uh, a lot on there and, and you can contact uh, Tawana or myself if you have any questions about EJ screen and using that tool uh, for investigating environmental justice issues uh, in communities. So real quick, I'll talk about some of the community revitalization programs that we work with. We have three major programs and, and the, the gist of all of them, the way that most of them work is that um, first, uh, a community, uh, usually it's an organization, a, a local organization and a community will apply for this technical assistance to EPA. And once they're selected, uh, they develop a, a local steering committee, which is made up of uh, local leaders, local business owners, um, other community members. And, and this local steering committee, uh, through planning calls with EPA and EPA's contractors, will we'll plan out and host a, a larger workshop. And in this workshop, it brings together many more community members, other stakeholders. Uh, and, and the goal is to, is to come together and, and develop and, and have a conversation and develop uh, plans for, for equitably developing um, on their community. And, and as I mentioned, there's three major technical assistance programs. They're, they, they're each a little bit different. By the end of the workshop, um, all, uh, all communities will develop an action plan. And that action plan, they will be implementing for the next few years. And EPA will, will um, have calls with them throughout those next few years, uh, uh, keeping, keeping tabs on these. So let's, let's, let's look at these. Uh, the first one's local foods, local places. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's helping communities develop uh, local food networks and also really, uh, really grab onto what are the local places there? We don't, we don't want every town looking exactly the same when you walk into it. You know, what is special about your town? What is unique? And how can we highlight that and really make it something that's worth uh, loving and appreciating and, and visiting from others? And so this one's really focused on that local component. Uh, the next one is building blocks for uh, sustainable development, building blocks for equitable development. And, and this is, uh, uh, again, exactly what it sounds like. Um, this one really has a more uh, diverse um, methodology as far as tools. So there's about, there's about uh, 15 different tools that uh, EPA has come up with, EPA and partners have come up with in with this. In the last uh, late year, 2021, those four tools are listed below, the emerging mobility, leveraging cultural anchor institutions, and building regional disaster resilience, uh, and supporting equitable development. And so when those communities would have applied for this program, they would have applied for a specific tool. And the, the biggest part about this is that, is that these tools, once they're used with a community multiple times, with different communities, the same tool, um, EPA and, and, their, and their contractors and partners, we kind of, you know, we tweak it to really, you know, fit each community. But by the end of it, we kind of have this product, which is a very, you know, it's built on this, this knowledge that we got from these different communities. And we're able to distribute these uh, tools in a, in a public way so that communities can use these in a general sense. Now, the third and final one that I'll talk about is um, recreational economy for rural communities. And this one really focuses on Main Street and downtown areas. In downtown areas and the Main Street areas of towns, uh, that's often where racial segregation was the most intense and direct. And so equitably, uh, to equitably develop 
a main street or a downtown area, you really have to acknowledge and address that history in each community. And that helps to inform how we make uh, these recreational and economic opportunities available for everybody. And uh, along with ensuring that visitors and residents have access to these natural uh, outdoor amenities in, in these uh, areas, we're also develop in-town amenities. And, and that includes uh, broadband service, especially in rural areas, electric vehicle charging stations, uh, shops, restaurants, breweries, um, all these are uh, uh, things that we've worked with. So the final uh, slide, uh, I just wanted to really let everybody know about this uh, monthly resource guide that our office puts out. This is uh, a compilation of opportunities for funding, technical assistance, uh, there's tools and there's webinars, and all of it is about you know, environmental, uh, sustainable community and economic development. And, and again, this, this gets distributed every month. Uh, this is really specific to region two, which as I mentioned is, is New York, New Jersey, uh, US, Puerto, US Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, but um, about half of the opportunities are, 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 are national. And so even if you're not in one of those areas, uh, there's a lot of really good stuff in there. And obviously the webinars are anybody can access. So if you're interested in receiving that, um, you can email me at that, at that uh, address right there, at caldwell.lance at epa.gov. You can either email me there, uh, you can put your email in the chat if you don't mind other people seeing it, uh, or I think you can specifically chat me in this in this call. So you can send your email to me. Any of those ways, uh, you uh, you can get on that distribution list, and you'll and you'll receive this every month. So thanks for having us. Great, thank you so very much, Nikki, Tawana, Lance, and Kathleen as well. Um, in the Delaware River location, we are definitely blessed to have both EPA Region 2 and Region 3 uh, working with us. So I know this is just a small snapshot of all of EPA's programs um, and a small snapshot of FEMA and HUD's resources as well. And then we did not even capture the tools, programs, and resources that all of the other uh, federal agencies in the Urban Waters Federal Partnership have to offer. So I really encourage everyone to reach out to our speakers today or reach out to me if you are looking to get connected to any of these resources. We're really here to help and uh, connect federal agencies and federal resources down the chain and get these resources into our communities. Um, so at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Roberto, my fantastic planning partner for this webinar series. Uh, we have about five minutes for Q&A. So I encourage everyone to continue putting some Q&A in the chat or in the Q&A feature. Um, and I'll turn it over to Roberto and all of our speakers. Thank you and, and great presentations to everyone. Um, I, there was a question that came through also. Uh, so this one's for Shannon, and you talked about incorporating resilience goals early um, and how that's been helpful. How helpful have the symposiums been um, and really connecting with other groups with local partners? You're, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, Symposiums in general, I mean, I guess it's, you know, besides going to meetings of your professional association, it's kind of where you can meet a lot of the peers who, um, who have programs that might be allied programs that could be um, brought in as collaborators. So I think, I think symposiums are great. I, like everyone, I miss having in-person <laughs> symposiums, and it'll be great when we can get back to that. Um, but um, yeah, like uh, Lance and Nikki on the call, I know, you know, as well as Justin and probably we all first met at some kind of symposium, you know, like it's, it's a way where you sort of first get to know your network of peers, I would say. So I, I, think, they're, I think they're a terrific uh, feature of the sort of professional landscape for planners. Great, thank you. Uh, I asked partially also because uh, in this webinar series, what an opportunity for uh, different practitioners uh, to come together and, and meet and, and talk and 
And so that brings my next question to Justin, you know, because for HUD, I know a lot of times uh, the thought is about affordable housing, about uh, housing authorities. Uh, where do you see that intersection um, with climate, right? How does climate play into uh, development and, and the thought of HUD in that, in that sense? Sure. So I think, uh, so two parts. One, it's going to make good financial sense to make sure that you are being climate resilient, that you do have healthier housing, that you do improve your systems, so that when you are knocked out by a storm, especially for private developers, the one thing to keep in mind is that, uh, you know, unless you do have FEMA flood insurance, as a private entity, you often are not going to be covered. Uh, longer term on the on the public side, you know, th there is that coverage, but then we have a lot of um, bad outcomes for people if they aren't in places that are a little bit safer and more resilient. So what we're going to do at HUD is not just add in requirements that put better green building standards into our portfolio and the way that we manage our grants, but also kind of incentivize folks to see that return on investment for building resilience. I mean, we can, there's, there's a number of different ways to calculate it. The folks at EPA and FEMA probably have better ways than we do, but, um, you know, we can say it's a four to one or a 12 to one type of return on your investment when you're actually thinking about mitigating for future issues as well. Thanks, Roberto. Hope that answers. Definitely. Thank you. Uh, and the EPA team, great job uh, to all, and, and especially the uh, the case study, right? Because a lot of times we think uh, just about the area that, that we work in. Um, and and I, I have a question because I feel like uh, EPA does a lot of outreach uh, on the front end. And it looks like uh, when there's a disaster and when there's an issue, there's a, there's a lot of follow-up afterwards. Um, what's the best way for community members, to, someone who cares about this issue, uh, to engage uh, either in this work or the EPA uh, specifically? Yeah, what's the best way to connect? So in the case of, uh, of Frederickstead and St. Croix, it, it was a situation where community-based organizations engaged directly with EPA staff. So, um, and in some cases they went straight to the top, straight to Administrator Regan's office um, to try to get their point across. So I would say it's, you know, I wouldn't shy away from reaching out directly to EPA staff. I mean, that's why our, our emails are listed on the websites. Um, you know, for example, uh, Tawana is the EJ coordinator, so her email is there. Um, unfortunately, CDS doesn't have a website, uh, but you're welcome to reach out to me. And of course, through our grants and technical assistance as well. So as Lance was talking about the technical assistance opportunities that, um, that several communities in region two have received, that, that is a great way to engage with EPA in a much deeper way without receiving funding. So you, they really help you put together your project plan. And, um, and so that's a wonderful opportunity and the grants as well. So, um, so those, those would be three of my recommendations, but if technical assistance and grants aren't, aren't an option, I would say just reaching out directly to the EPA staff is great. Awesome, thank you, and and great tools. Uh, thanks for sharing, Lance, uh, as well, um, because I think that's it's helpful not just to be connected with people, although that's really important, uh, but also so many resources that are available at our fingertips with so much technology. Um, so I'll uh, end Q and A, and thank you so much, and turn it over to Erica. Thank you. Thanks so much, Roberta, and thanks to all of our speakers. Uh, we are at one o'clock, so just. I just want to say one last round of thank yous um, to HUD and to my fellow PDE staff members and to our other Delaware River Urban Waters location partners. Thank you all of our attendees for joining us for this webinar series. Um, and please feel to reach out uh, and we hope to work with you soon. Thanks. Thank you.